Hi everyone, I'm Heidi Murakoff, creator of What to Expect, and I am so excited to host our first ever What to Expect Mom Hall. And we're kicking off with a topic that is so close to my heart and so fundamental to the health and well-being of moms and babies, maternal mental health. And because it wouldn't be a mom hall without the moms, we have an awesome group of moms from the What to Expect community joining us today to share their personal maternal mental health experiences. And I'm also honored to have by my virtual side, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse for HHS, who is leading the effort to bring maternal mental health the attention it deserves and working to ensure that moms who are struggling with symptoms of a perinatal mood disorder know the signs and find the support and the resources that they need to heal. Dr. Delphin Rittman, Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us on this important topic. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with SAMHSA and with HHS and, of course, the brand new mental health resources that moms and, and those who love them can tap into? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I first want to say, Heidi, thank you so much for having me here and, and for con convening. Um, this is such an important conversation, so really appreciate the opportunity to be able to participate. And, um, you know, so there are, uh, you know, a, a number of resources uh, that I'm happy to share about. And um, one thing I can say is that, you know, at SAMHSA, uh, my work and our work is really about helping to improve the behavioral health um, of the nation. And so that absolutely includes moms and um, helping to get out resources and information. And, you know, a couple of resources I want to share information about is, you know, on Mother's Day this past year, uh, Helping mm -hmm. Human Services uh, released uh, a maternal mental health hotline. Uh, it's a hotline that's available across the nation. Uh, it's free. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it's confidential. Uh, and moms can call to get, uh, or loved ones, uh, can call to get information about uh, their mental health, about what they may be experiencing, whether it's um, postpartum, um, depression or anxiety uh, or other challenges they may be experiencing. And when they call the hotline, they'll be linked with a trained uh, counselor who is uh, aware of maternal mental health uh, needs and challenges and can provide support right there on the line. Uh, right there on the line or also connect moms uh, to other resources within their community that may be helpful. Uh, and so that number is, you know, 1-833-9-HELP-FOR-MOMS. So 1-833-9-HELP-FOR-MOMS. That's, that's so awesome. I was so excited for that Mother's Day present. And it's going to be a gift that keeps on giving. I have to say that for sure. Yeah. Um, I do want to start with some of the symptoms that moms might experience to look out for. And, and I think we have to keep in mind that there's a world of difference between uh, a mood disorder, a maternal mood disorder, and, you know, the pregnancy mood swings, the baby blues. You know, because with with uh, mood swings, you know, you're up, you're down, you're crying during insurance commercials, right? Um, but they come and they go during pregnancy, and, and that's usually normal. Um, postpartum uh, baby blues, you know, it, it also comes and goes. You're weepy and emotional and overwhelmed. But for one in five moms, actually, and, you know, we're finding out how underdiagnosed mental health conditions are mm -hmm. um, during pregnancy and postpartum, the symptoms are more pervasive and, you know, persistent. So they last more than the two weeks of, of say, baby blues. I'd like to welcome one of those moms who is a mom to a two and a half year old and a six year old. Um, Dylan, thanks for being here today. Hey. hey. Yeah. Um, Did, can you share something about uh, what you were feeling and how, when did you realize it wasn't the way you were supposed to feel? Sure. So I have a two and a half year old and a six month old. And so if you do mm -hmm. the math, a two and a half year old would have been born in March of 2020. So right as, oh. right. Oh. <laughs> so there's a layer of complexity. Oh, yes. 
to that postpartum yeah. period for me. Uh, um, and so I was screened and um, at that two week and that six week and I was a little bit high, but there wasn't a lot of follow up afterwards. Um, and so I had those that hormone ride that you do in the beginning, but it wasn't until probably nine months in that I got a diagnosis mm -hmm. and my symptoms manifested more as a detachment. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get to low and I couldn't get to high. I couldn't get, I didn't have any feelings and I didn't connect. I wasn't connecting with the baby. I wasn't connecting with my husband. I wasn't connecting with the rest of my family. Like I just wasn't there. And the other symptom that was pretty wild um, was just a hypervigilance that was mm -hmm. related to anxiety. So I would hear my baby cry um, and my baby was out of the house, right? I would hear my baby cry over the monitor and I would go down and she was fine. Um, it would manifest in the car when I was driving and she would fall asleep. I would have to turn off all the radio because I thought, oh, okay, if I can't hear her, then something's wrong. So I was like, pull off at the nearest exit, check, she's asleep, she's fine, I'm a mess. So it was, it, it was a really sort of head trip to sort of have this, extreme detachment and also this extreme sort of hyper vigilance at, um, at the same time yeah. yeah and it really wasn't i wasn't fully aware of it until my partner my husband was pointing it out to me um, and was like yo my love you are not you are not right you are not yourself you're not here um so yeah this room that was my trip and that's really important because you know the moms are aware of postpartum depression I feel like it's almost, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions, um, and Dr. Delphin Whitman, please weigh in on this, um, that it's only postpartum and it's only depression. And people even shorthand it. I, I hear all the time, you know, I had the postpartum, mm -hmm. but it isn't always postpartum. It's sometimes during pregnancy and it's not right away always. It can start right away. It can start nine months. It can start you know, anytime in the first year, it can even start when you wean your baby. So, and it's not just depression. There are so many different ways as you experience it, it manifests. And so if you're not feeling depressed, you might think, yeah, this isn't, this isn't postpartum depression. Well, it isn't. It's a mood disorder. It could be anxiety disorder. Um, you could have rage. You could have detachment as you experience racing thoughts, um, postpartum PTSD when especially if you've had a really complicated pregnancy um, or a traumatic delivery or you've had trauma previously in your past so it shows up in so many different ways yeah yeah absolutely i mean that's right on and you know dylan i just want to thank you for sharing your experiences and and for sharing what you've gone through i think it's it's so important for moms to hear from other moms and and to um so they can know that they're not alone uh, so, so thank you for, for sharing. And, um, and it's true. I mean, pregnancy, we know can bring on just a range of emotions, uh, throughout the experience. Um, as you said, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, postpartum, it could be at any point during the pregnancy experience. Um, and the emotions that are felt are, are not just depression. You know, we often talk about and hear about sort of postpartum depression. Um, but, you know, Dylan, as you've described, and, and you know, we know that people can experience um, feelings of anxiety, feelings of sadness, uh, feelings of worry, uh, along with depression, or in some instances, uh, instead of uh, depression. Um, and so it's really a range of uh, emotions that, uh, that moms can potentially feel. Um, one thing we find also is that, you know, sometimes the feelings will resolve. For some people, they resolve on their own, sometimes within, uh, you know, a, a few weeks, um, but sometimes not, uh, sometimes not. And, and, you know, when they tend to um, extend out over time, uh, then increasingly, you know, that's a time and it's important for moms to reach out and, and get help, um, whether it be you know, connecting with other moms, you know, connecting with uh, a trained counselor. Um, that's one way that the maternal mental health hotline can be helpful. Um, because again, if, if a mom is beginning to um, not feel, 
you know, not feel quite right or not feel like herself and feeling like it's extending out over time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, by calling the, the maternal mental health hotline again, can talk with a trained counselor um, and get support right there in the moment, but then also get linked to other um, services and supports that may be available. Um, you know, within a person's immediate community. So a broad range of resources available potentially. Which is awesome and so needed. And, you know, there are factors that can put you at risk for having a perinatal mood disorder, which we should also be aware of because if you had a history of depression or anxiety in the past, or you have a family history, or, you know, even something like a thyroid condition, um, that's something that's, you know, often not tested for, but it's one of the, the reasons why you could have depression. It causes depression and it's fairly common to have, a, 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 you know, an overactive then underactive um, thyroid condition it's called postpartum thyroiditis. So mm -hmm. it's always something that's good to be tested for. Mm -hmm. um, so recognizing the symptoms is always the first step. The next step is getting the help that you need and deserve. And moms have so much pressure on them, way too much pressure uh, to be, you know, mom strong. The reality is, and I tell moms this all the time, because I think it's so important, is sometimes being strong means asking for help. And here to talk about taking that first, that second, but really courageous step, asking for help is mother of a one-year-old or almost one-year-old daughter, Nasari. Welcome, Nasari. So happy thank to have you. you here and thank you for sharing. Can you thank tell you. us a little bit about the path that you took to find yes. that supportive therapist? Yes, of course. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you so much for having me today. Um, it is a true, truly an honor just to be able to speak on this platform um, that I utilize throughout my own pregnancy with my daughter, throughout my highs and my lows. So thank you so much. Um, my relationship with mental health is one that I truly had to develop. I, uh, growing up as a Black and Fijian Indian born woman, I had no concept of mental health throughout my childhood that um, did not come up naturally. So I definitely had to develop my relationship with it. And because of this um, culturally in past generations, uh, the topic of mental health itself is often taboo. And we just didn't talk about it. My ancestors were expected to take on this invisible load um, that was given to them and often suffered in silence. And because I knew this, I took it upon myself to fully indulge into all things mental health. And other than being a wife and a mom, um, I had to be there for me and really hone in and nurture who I am in order to nurture my family. So it was a humbling experience, I can say that, because it was something I had to surrender. This idea you guys mentioned, like being mom strong, as a Black woman alone, you have to be strong. You know, you have all these societal pressures and, and uh, things that you just experience experience that might not be as common for the next counterpart but I had to take that into consideration and ask myself like why do I have to be strong all the time what about my my weak moments and it's okay when I'm feeling bad and I don't have to do that alone most importantly so in order to lead as example for my peers and my clients I had to take that step and just kind of being like hey I'm about to transition into this new chapter and I can't do this alone. And if I want to do it the right way, I have to build a support network. And that was what was so important to me. Um, as a Black woman, it's extremely important to find someone you can control, um, you can connect with culturally as well. So I utilize resources um, on social media um, to be able to find a therapist that I connected to. And um, it's important to note, like Dylan mentioned, uh, my daughter's turning one, so if it was throughout the pandemic um, that I was pregnant and experiencing this new journey um, and it brought on a lot of anxiety for me you know that fear of getting sick or or just you know the unknown not knowing what was going to happen and once I started to notice those symptoms I knew okay I need to build my network now and build my support system so um, there's a lot of different um, 
resources that they have now. I'm so happy that the resource for the hotline is available. Also, one good thing that came out of the pandemic is telehealth and being able to have access to like therapy and um, teletherapy online. Um, I utilize BetterHelp, which is an app that you can use and they um, connect you to a therapist. You can text, you can call, you can Zoom. So it's super um, resourceful and in your you're able to utilize the um, resources no matter where you are. Um, there's also a therapy service called um, Therapy for Black Girls, and I was able to be linked to a therapist that I connected to culturally in my community um, near me. So various different resources like that, I was able to get the help that I need, but very humbling um, experience for sure. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I feel like so many other moms can learn from your experience, um, caring is caring. Um, <laughs> now, Delvin Whitman, there are so many challenges that moms can face, and Nisari overcame every obstacle in her way, which is an am amazing thing, um, and something other moms should, should try to emulate. But it, what if you're having, you know, especially for moms of color? Uh, who are more likely to be impacted by a, a maternal mood disorder, um, but who are statistically so much less likely to receive the, the care that they need. What's your best advice? Um, we already heard some great advice, but do you have other advice for accessing the care? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And and I first want to st start by saying, you know, thank you, Nasari, for sharing your story and for just all those nuggets of wisdom. You know, you you talked about how, you know, it was it was okay not to be okay, and for you to be a um, a good mom, it, it meant you know reaching out and getting help and and taking care of yourself. And so I, I I just thank you for sharing all of that because I think it's it's helpful again for folks to know that they're not alone. Um, and your story brings both help, uh, you know, hope and inspiration. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's important for not moms to know that again, if they're struggling, um, you know, they need not struggle alone. It, it's true, the data does show that, you know, African-American um, moms as well as individuals, you know, across the board are, are less likely to access services. And so, um, you know, Nasari mentioned a number of resources that are available. Um, a person could get connected through to a range of resources to include many of the ones that Asari mentioned um, by calling the maternal mental health uh, hotline. Uh, and by sharing with the trained counselor about what a person's preferences are, what their interests are, um, you know, how they'd like to connect, with who they'd like to connect, um, you know, going through all of that with the counselor that they connect with uh, online can, can then help to triage them and connect them to uh, services and supports that aligned with their cultural interests and and uh, their their worldview and and uh, you know and how they want to connect around getting support. Um, the counselors that are part of the the helpline and again this is a line that's put out by HRSA, the Health Services and Researches uh, Research Resources Administration. Uh, but it, it, the the counselors who work uh, on that line are trained to be culturally responsive and can help to connect people uh, and moms. Uh, to uh, services and supports within their communities. That, that's so awesome. And you know, uh, like I always say, no mom stands alone or no mom should stand alone. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, getting the treatment that you need, the diagnosis and the, and the treatment is essential, but it also takes a village, mm -hmm. right? And it takes a village not only to raise a child, but to support a mom. And that village, you know, that network of support, it can take many forms. Um, it can be your partner. Dylan, you found out that your partner was the one who noticed what was up with you. And um, it can be friends and family. It can be a virtual community like we have on, on what to expect. Um, I want to welcome Christina, mom of, let's see. You have a one-year-old? We have a lot of one-year-olds here. <laughs> we have her at the table? Yes. I saw, I saw a head poking out there somewhere. Yeah, she just fell asleep. <laughs> oh, perfect timing. <laughs> perfect timing. You got a good one there. Um, they're all great. I, I, I wanted to know, 
What are some of the ways that you build up your support system, Christina? And and what has that support system meant to you? Um, well, first, I want to echo what Nasiri was saying. Like, what to expect helped me in so many ways. Like, every month during my pregnancy, I would send my partner, like, look, this is what's supposed to be going on. These are the questions we should be asking the doctor. And just, like, being a part of the uh, community virtually and listening to other mom stories, like, it just helped. And even now to this day, like, I still keep up with it. So I'm honored to share my experience. And I'm so grateful, you know, for the information that you all, you know, have out and available for us. So um, as far as support, um, <laughs> so my experience is unique in the sense of like wasn't planning for a baby relocated <laughs> before well was planning to relocate before finding out that we were expecting so oh finding out i was expecting and relocating to a new city with no job my anxiety was through the roof and Right. Even before that, I had already been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, so I would overthink everything, you know. And um, when I relocated, I was with my partner, now fiance, um, and it was just us, you know. His dad lives here, but he is busy, you know, and I didn't have any of my close knit family, so I was like kind of scrambling, like, what do I do? And not yeah. until I was going through the experience that I understood like how vital it is to have that support. And because I couldn't have uh, my family close to me, I just utilized FaceTime, you know, getting their support over the phone. Um, and definitely like once I relocated here, I found a therapist that I, you know, could connect with because I knew like during my pregnancy and even post-pregnancy, like I was gonna need a therapist, you know, I was gonna need someone to talk to, um, just to vent and, you know, get advice and tools on how to maneuver everything because, yeah, you don't know what it's like until you go through it. Like, <laughs> true story, <laughs> like, true oh, story, yeah. Christina. Oh my, yeah, yeah. yeah. say yeah. it. So, and, and I love how you guys are highlighting the fact that for moms, like I was not, um program to ask for help like before relocating i was a director at a boys and girls club i'm used to being in charge i'm used to taking the load i'm used to you know um just yeah just being in charge and like i always have to have the answer so it's like going through this experience i did not have the answers and i did not know what to do at all and i i um think about one experience my my partner he was at work and it was a day like everything that could have went wrong that day went wrong and i'm just here by myself and my partner came home and you know we're learning how to clean our baby and all this kind of stuff and he said like oh like um did you clean this part and i just broke down <laughs> like i was and it wasn't anything that he was doing but because the day was yeah. so bad i just fell apart and you know what he said he was like you're doing a great job you know i was just asking like it's okay and i lost it he's like you know what i got you the rest of the day i'll take care of cali like you could just take a step back and like he just knew what i needed in that moment and like from there on out i was like okay like i don't have to hold the burden of everything like i can ask him he's gonna be there he's gonna support me um in anything that i do and to this day like if i ask him to do something or like he'll just do it on his own like it just means the world because if i had to do this by myself i don't know i don't know what position i would be in and yeah i think fathers are such an important um part of the solution you know a lot of times people see them as a problem no they are the solution and you know there's nothing that a mother can do that a father can't do just as well if not give a uh, better given the opportunity and also well besides breastfeed but but working together as a team is so helpful and yeah dads can experience postpartum depression too but the research kind of shows that not usually at the same time. So when you are a team, you know, if one of you is falling, the other can pick you up. That's perfect. I mean, that happened in my house too. You know, I didn't have, I, I was a weepy emotional mess. And my husband who'd never held a baby before in his life, he tucked me into bed, took over. <laughs> and and that's, that's the way it should be, you know, supporting each other. If you have that partner in your life, um, but Dr. Ritman, um, Delphin Ritman, 
Um, being a, a new parent is always super isolating. Um, I, I feel we've all gone through that. You feel like you're alone. Christina, you were just expressing that, how you felt alone all day long. But it's been become so much more isolating during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for moms who live far away from their family and their friends and their network of support. I work with a lot of military moms. There certainly have been, I mean, they're always more isolated, but you know, they're isolated and can't, you know, have, have come home or have, you know, during the pandemic, it was just really stressful. Rural moms who don't have a big community around them, maybe they don't have their family and friends. Um, how do we make sure that they're not, these moms are not falling through the cracks if they don't have others around them to pick them up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, such such an important question and an important area to to really consider and to look at. And and you know, Christine, I appreciated your you know sharing your experiences around you know realizing that you know what it's okay to um, to not have all the answers and to reach out for support and to get help. And um, and and we know that you know that there is strength and strength in that. That sometimes asking for help is where the strength comes and and relief comes. And so thank you for sharing your um, experiences as well. And. You know, I mean, I think the the thing it, it's important for moms to sort of build build the network. You know, build their network, and and certainly, as you mentioned, you know, through the pandemic, uh, you know, there have been challenges uh, there, or for individuals living in rural communities, there may be challenges there. Um, we know that there are many different robust online, um, you know, mom and parenting communities and resources, and so that certainly um, is an avenue to get connected to support groups or um, even, uh, you know, additional uh, therapy support if that's needed. Um, and again, you know, I just and you know, it's funny, you know, this is one thing that I love about the maternal mental health uh, hotline is that uh, it can be a resource to help to help link. Um, moms and families to a broad range of community-based resources and supports, whether it be telehealth, um, you know, whether it be connecting uh, a mom and the family with a faith community, um, a faith community if that's of interest, um, or other, you know, natural supports and resources within the person's immediate environment, um, in addition to other you know, um, more formal services or supports like therapy or, or telehealth. Um, one additional sort of resource that is available across the country, and it's something that we find, is they're called uh, Certified Community uh, Behavioral Health Clinics, CCBHCs. Um, they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, whether an individual has insurance or not, and provide a broad range of mental health, substance use, uh, case management uh, related work and, and support. Uh, and so again, the, the helpline can help to connect individuals to uh, CCBHCs, which are across the country as well. Um, and then another resource I want folks to know about. So, you know, I've mentioned the helpline a lot, but if a person is, is in crisis and they're having thoughts of, of um, like really in crisis, having thoughts of self-harm, you know, suicide or, or you know, significant uh, mental health crisis or substance use related crisis, you know, they can also call 988. And so that's a different helpline. Um, you know, the, the mom uh, line that I mentioned is for moms that are looking for support, uh, whether they're experiencing I, I anxiety or depression or, um, you know, some other um, parenting related distress. Um, 988 would be for moms that are really in crisis and need, you know, more immediate support and attention. Uh, and the support and help there could include a mobile crisis team uh, or individual, you know, coming to meet with the mom on site uh, related to whatever the crisis may be. Um, and so I want folks to know that that's available as well. And the biggest message is this, if, you know, folks are struggling, they need, need not you know, if moms are struggling, they it's not something they have to go through alone. You know, know that there are a range of supports available through either of the helplines that I mentioned that can help connect moms to other resources uh, within their communities um, or even virtually as well. Yeah, and you don't want to wait to feel better. If you're in crisis or you feel like you're coming close to that point mm -hmm. or if someone you love is in crisis or you feel is getting to that point, you want to call right away. Don't wait for it to pass. Um, and of course, if, if you have any feelings that you might harm yourself or your baby, you got to get someone there immediately, whether it's a family member, neighbor, anybody 
um, put your baby in a safe place and and make sure that that you get that help immediately. And it's not your fault. None of this is your fault. None of this, none of it is ever your fault. So we we tend to you know think that it, have guilt over having a, you know mental health issues. No, no guilt allowed. This is an, a guilt-free zone. Yes. Uh, really important. Um, you know, something else that I notice a lot is that as as new moms, and I've been guilty of this twice, we're, we're so busy nurturing our babies that we forget to nurture ourselves. And moms need care and feeding, just like babies do. Um, moms need emotional feeding. And one of my favorite things about the What to Expect community is that moms feed each other that support. That's that's so vital. And we have Alexandra here, um, who is Allie, who's going to show share her experiences on the What to Expect community. Um, she is Allie. You are also a group leader on on What to, to Expect community, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I also, like the other moms, followed the What to Expect app throughout my whole entire pregnancy. My sister put me onto the app um, and she kind of just did it for the uh, veggies of each veggie the going along. Uh, but I stayed for the for the group and the group support because like the other moms too, I also have um, the general anxiety and manifested into the mom anxiety now. So um, I think the most important way that our community surprise, su provides support is through just listening and just mm -hmm. simply um, having the ability to share that empathy. I see so many posts of comments of like, I'm not sure I don't understand what you're going through, but I'm here for you and you can still vent. Or I have other posts that say, um, I don't have any advice, but know that you're not alone. And I think that alone for all of us on what to expect helps us to provide um, so much support um, in that. And I think um, it's also important, like you said, that it's, an, it's important that you provide, that there's moms who, who we can seek the, see the signs. Cause sometimes us as moms, we don't see the signs within ourselves, but other moms would be like, okay, this sounds more like an emergency. You have somebody safe to go to, but then there's also the little things that are like, oh, you know, it's okay, you're gonna get, through the baby crying all night long and the little, the more less serious um, anxieties too. So I think that what to expect provides, I've seen a big range of the little discrepant, the little anxieties to the major anxieties. And I love that the community simply supports by me, um, in, by major, um, most importantly, by listening, listening and just being there. And I think that's like key to um, helping support others along with, um, you know, providing resources, but just simply listening, I think is key to to supporting others. Mm -hmm. that's, that's so great to hear. And that's really the spirit of our community. But it's also the spirit of motherhood, you know, because I always say motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood. And it doesn't matter where in the world you go, no matter what your socioeconomic, religious, racial, cultural, political profile, this is something that brings us all together. You know, we talk about, you know, things that divide us and, you know, things that that we can come together on. Well, this, this, you know, we all share the same goals. We all share an emotional bond. We all want what's best for ourselves and our babies and our families. And, and that's a great example. You know, it's never our place to judge, only to support, because we don't know what a, another mom is going through. We need to support every mom without judgment. That's critically important. Um, and and I also want to mention again that fathers, one in ten fathers, and Dr. Delphin Rittman, if you want to speak a little to that, it's not exclusive to moms, postpartum anxiety disorders and mood disorders. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, Allie, thank you for, for sharing the piece around, you know what, just listening, um, just having someone there to listen um, and to hold, uh, you know, mom's experiences, you know, to hold your experiences with you, that that's so important. Um, and Heidi, absolutely. You know, we know that fathers also can experience feelings of postpartum um, depression or anxiety or any of the range of feelings that 
uh, a mom may be experiencing, uh, a father can experience as well. Um, and so the helpline is available. Certainly, you know, dads can call as well. Um, there are services and supports and resources that are available for, uh, for dads as well. And um, again, whether they be formal uh, services like telehealth, or um, connecting with the community center um, or, you know, other community-based services that are, uh, you know, less formal. So support groups for parents, uh, you know, there are combined support groups for, for moms and dads or support groups just for dads or support groups for moms. And, um, and again, through the helpline, uh, an individual can get, again, share their preferences, like the ways in which they would like to get support and, and ask for assistance in terms of connecting with some of those resources or supports uh, in the person's immediate uh, immediate area, or even virtually. You know, the virtual supports, as we've talked about, um, can be, be real helpful as well um, and help with like creating that sense of community um, and building that sense of community such that uh, you know, either the the uh, moms, the dads, so the family itself can get can get support. So certainly reach out. That, I think that's my main message that um, that if a mom is struggling, there are all kinds of resources and supports, or a dad is struggling, all kinds of resources and supports that are available uh, through uh, you know through the helpline to include linking with uh, many of the really rich and robust online communities as well. And you won't be judged and there should be no stigma, no taboos um, and, and only support. And if you find that you've benefited from that kind of support, I can't emphasize this enough. Go and, you know, mom it forward, dad it forward, you know, build a community so you can help others um, who are experiencing the same things that you're experiencing. Um, and, and actually that, that nugget of reaching out is a really great way. I don't, need, I don't ever want to end this conversation because I think we're just getting started. There's so much more to talk about. Um, this is a conversation that we didn't have for generations. You know, up until very recently, we swept it under the carpet, swept it under the couch, like all the desk bunnies that are, that are busy creating when you're a new parent. <laughs> Right? You just swept it under, but no, no more sweeping. Let the dust bunnies be wherever they need to be. Let them breed. We don't worry about the dust bunnies. We worry about you and having this conversation. So I just wanted to see if all of you have like one nugget of advice um, that you can share that helped you get through this difficult time and could help another mom or dad. And I'm, because this is my mom haul. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two, two nuggets here. And the first thing is that you should find a doula. Um, we actually have a doula here um, and <laughs> we do. And Nasari is, um, is a doula, but we need more doulas because doulas um, are, are the missing link in maternal health care. The other thing I would say is wear your baby. And both of those things, obviously you're wearing your baby when you're pregnant, but postpartum, wear your baby. Your hands free, but also the research shows that being close to your baby helps. It's not a treatment, it's not a cure, but it helps with those feelings. Um, okay, next up, Dylan, go for it. <laughs> um, sleep training or have a plan for sleep. The difference between like four hours of sleep and six hours of sleep is bigger than you think it is. Oh, yeah. So like I, you can really cruise on like six hours of sleep for a while, but you cannot do that when you're getting less than four or three. So mm -hmm. that was Absolutely. revolutionary for me. <laughs> Good point. And um, Nisari, how about you? Yes, um, I would. I, one thing I always say to my clients and just peers is that when it comes to like our mental health you got to think about it like maintenance that you would do for your car it's preventative care so you have to build that support network reaching out for a therapist before things get hard is so important just because if you're doing all of these steps now when things get rough you'll be prepared so please Think about yourself like a car, you know, feed, feed yourself <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Christina, how about you? Um, I would say my takeaway that I think about is like, don't lose yourself when you become a mom. Like still 
keep a part of what you were doing before you were a mom. So if that's getting a coffee with your friend, listening to your favorite podcast, taking a bath. Me, I love to cook, so that was my therapy. Just leave me in the kitchen by myself. Let me listen to some music and, you know, cook a good meal. My food is actually pretty good, so I enjoy doing it. And my partner, he loves my food. But yeah, just keep something for yourself because if mom is not well, then baby is not well. You know, you have to do those things that made you happy before you were a mom to, you know, just keep going. So yeah, don't lose yourself. Keep doing the things that were making you happy before you were a mom. And Love. You'll be good and then baby will be good. <laughs> Love that. Um, nurture the nurturers. And Allie, how about you? So my biggest um, my biggest nugget is my mom. And for others, it doesn't have to necessarily be your mom. It could be your friend, your spouse, your best friend, whoever it is that you could just talk to and find that support in. Um, I know lots of people are timid about therapy. So at the very least, just have one other person who could be there for you to support you and for me that's my mom I talk to her all day long and I don't let my anxiety make me feel like I'm a burden so that's my advice for others is find that one person and don't let your anxiety make you feel like a burden you talk to whoever you need to talk to to stay sane you are you ain't having your her daughter so that's like that's for sure we all need to lighten the load and and I would say if anybody needs a mom I'm always around for you just message me. I'm there for you. So, I'm, I'm mom to me. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having this conversation. So important. And um, I, I feel like we've said, but it's important to say again, no mom should suffer in silence. And because we all believe in that, we have to keep the noise, keep the conversation up and make sure we're always, always listening. So big hugs to everyone. Love you guys. <laughs>